It looks such a straightforward place from the outside. Too much so for me, really. A bit plain. And it seems that way inside, too, to begin with. You walk through the nave, which is quite short, because when it was built there were few people who used it, only visitors and onlookers. The real business of the Abbey, the worship and glorification of God, done elsewhere, through these gates. This is the choir, and ahead is the sanctuary and the high altar. But beyond that, there seems to be another chapel, and some sort of ramparts beyond that. Unlike the nave, the choir is long, as it had to be to accommodate the whole of the monastic community, which seven or eight times a day gathered here to sing and worship. This was the hub of Westminster Abbey. There's no going up the altar steps, and instead one goes round the side, where there are more gates and tombs at every turn, a cemetery in fact. Though it's also not unlike walking round the outside deck of a liner, the high altar, the sanctuary and the shrine, like the bridge in the engine room, somewhere in the middle. Until you come up these unexpected steps and past yet more elaborate gates into the prow of the abbey and its tremendous surprise, the Lady Chapel, the chapel of Henry VII. It was finished around 1512 the last great flowering of medieval Christianity. And seeing it now, grey as a shin bone, it's hard to imagine that then every inch of it was painted and gilded, and the windows bright with coloured glass. But scarcely had the builders carted away their rubble and the painters taken down their scaffolding when the medieval church was split apart. The Reformation had begun, and abbeys such as this faced ruin. Within a few years, Henry VIII had closed down the monasteries, taken over their lands, carted away the furniture and fittings, and the remains were left to decay and gather dust. Today, we think the destruction of the Reformation was shocking, criminal. But I don't know. The secular side of the Reformation, and certainly the dissolution of the monasteries, ought to be more readily understandable to us in the 1990s than at any time in the last 400 years. And had the Abbey been anywhere else but at Westminster, Henry VIII's commissioners would have come in, taken away the gold and precious stones, stripped the lead off the roof, and left the rest to nature and market forces which is, after all, what happened at Fountains Abbey in Kirkstall, Revo. But then, they weren't the burial place of kings. Queen Victoria sat in the chair twice. Firstly in 1837 in her crown and all her regalia at the coronation, and 50 years later at her jubilee in her little white bonnet and black dress. Anybody could sit here in the 18th century, provided they tipped the verger, and they could also wield Edward III's seven-foot sword of state, which used to stand beside it. While not quite stripped pine, it suits our present-day fad for natural surfaces. 
but when it was first made around 1300 it was wholly gilded and painted and covered in semi-precious stones and beads and must have looked as much fairground as gothic perhaps even a bit common what has brought it down to its present tasteful state is time and a series of terrible indignities a suffragette's bomb that exploded at the back of it the brief theft of the stone in 1950 by Scottish nationalists George IV sawed off all the crockets and the Victorians varnished it so heavily that most of the original paintwork was destroyed generations of Westminster schoolboys have carved their names on it including one boy who slept in it one night in 1800 and left a message on the seat to say so it was someone in Victorian times who added the lions but they needn't have bothered it's such a familiar stick of national furniture battered and handed down and the monarchy nowadays so anxious not to be remote they could have dispensed with the lions and just put it on rockers. Once upon a time, the monks would rise at three to say prime, the first office of the day. Devotions nowadays begin at seven, with half an hour silent prayer in St. Faith's Chapel followed by the saying of Martins. And guide our feet in the way of peace. Glory to the Father and While anyone may come to this service, it's most frequently attended by those who work in and around the Abbey, the Abbey family. When I first heard the Dean use this phrase, I cynically took it as one of those wishful sentiments we use nowadays in an attempt to cosify the world. I was quite wrong. first verse I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help now what does that second line really mean any ideas I don't know At the boys age I probably thought that the hills were where to look for the arrival of the US cavalry the Abbey is what is called a royal peculiar set apart by its charter from the ordinary jurisdiction of the Church of England, with the Dean answerable not to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but directly to the Sovereign. So this is the Queen's Parish Church. But it's also the chapel of Westminster School, and three times a week, and before they're open to visitors, the choir and transepts fill up with boys and girls for the school's morning chapel. begin this act of worship with hymn number 372. Boring hymns, except if they're lucky they'll remember them all their lives. Discouraged and unrelenting, in they come, the tribes of Nike and Adidas and Reebok. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches 
to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When they're old, will they remember these mornings in the abbey, scanning the stalls for a particular face? Will hymns bring it back, or the smell of cold stone and the voluntary? As the tourists wait to troop in, the school troops out. Even at 9.15 in the morning, these Westminster boys and girls armoured in their careful languor. What was all that eye of the needle stuff? Didn't apply to us, did it, James? No. And anyway, we are clever. Selfishly speaking, wrote Henry James, there are too many people in Westminster Abbey. You feel yourself at times in danger of thinking meanly of the human personality. Numerosity, as it were, swallows up quality. And the perpetual sense of other elbows and knees begets a yearning for the desert. And that was in 1870. Well, as I say, Westminster Abbey is a royal peculiar church, and it is run by the dean and chapter. And it's the dean now, who is the our present dean, is the uh, Reverend uh, Michael Mayne. He's very sort of important dean because he's answerable to one person, and that's the visitor uh, of the Queen. Uh, but this being a special and a royal peculiar church, it's uh, entirely self-funding. We rely very much, of course, on yourselves coming here because it costs around about four million pounds uh, to uh, run Westminster Abbey per year. Uh, we don't uh, receive any state aid or any other church. One needs to remember that, like Venice, the Abbey has always been a venue for tourists. In its earliest days, pilgrims would come to look at the Confessor's shrine and view the relics. And pilgrims are, after all, simply tourists on their knees. We've run out of space, literally. There are 3,000 people buried in this church. There are 400 monuments in here as well. There has actually been a church on this site since the seventh century. And what I said, like a shoal of fish. So they don't bury people here in Westminster Abbey anymore. Uh, all they do now is inter ashes here. And uh, the ashes of Lawrence Olivier is, so I think, about the last ashes to be turred in uh, Westminster Abbey. Are we all met? Just about. I brought you into the nave of a church whose history goes back probably to the early part of the 7th century, the early 600s. The first church of any real importance here was under a king of England when we used to have seven kings and seven kingdoms, King Offa, who actually endowed a church here in 785. But the first truly important church was after the last Anglo-Saxon king. As a royal burial place, Westminster is unique. The only comparable spot, the Abbey of Saint-Denis in Paris, where the French kings are buried. The French Revolution put paid to that. Fifty royal tombs broken up in as many hours. Two days to destroy the work of 12 centuries. Nothing comparable happened here. And when Henry VIII's commissioners went into the monasteries and stripped them of their assets, Westminster largely survived. Preserved because so many royal dead lie round. The most remarkable survival is the shrine itself. And in it, just about here, the body of Edward the Confessor. Saint, founder of the Abbey, the last of the Saxon kings who died in 1066. Other shrines were not so lucky. Henry VIII destroyed virtually all of them, including St. Cuthbert's at Durham, where he chucked out the body and stripped the place. St Albans, and the richest shrine of all, that of Thomas a Becket at Canterbury.
but not Edward the Confessor. And here, though robbed of all its finery, is his battered stone box still. Now why? Well, not because he was a saint, obviously. No, it was because he was a king, and Henry VIII was a king. And there's a trade union of kings. Injure one, you injure them all. Saint or sinner, Catholic or Protestant, kings and queens stick together. And right until the end of the 18th century, a strange, almost unbelievable fact, the area around the shrine was swept daily and the sweeping sent off with whatever sacred dust they contained to Catholic Spain and Portugal. We pass to the north aisle. I have it yet. Ahead of you, middle. No, wait a minute. Here we go. This way is north. We're headed east. But this used to be the royal burial place. There were 2,000 people buried in this church. They're like sardines, <laughs> side by side. Don't look so worried. I'm not going to tell you about all of them. There's no plan or pattern to burial in the abbey. You elbowed your way in where you could, and some of the side chapels in particular are a bit of a jumble. They're rather like some specialised left luggage office. Tombs shoved in like trunks, waiting to be redeemed at the resurrection. And space was always limited, and even when you bagged a place, you weren't sure of hanging on to it. In this tomb are some of the children of Henry III and Edward I, they were nicely tucked up in a spot in the shrine and then found themselves booted out and put down here because Richard II fancied the same spot for the tomb of his wife. Sorry, change of plan. Hope you don't mind, I'm putting you in the spare room. Good morning. Thank you. I don't like churches charging or even shaming visitors into making supposedly voluntary offerings. But at least at Westminster it has the sanction of history. The monks were charging pilgrims to see the shrine and the tombs in the 15th century. And besides, the Church of England gives the Abbey no income. One pound change. And take a loaf for it for most of the Italian? Espanol? Espanol? Ah. Thank you. More famous for founding the Metropolitan Police Force. At that time, they were nicknamed the Peelers, after his surname. And today, we sometimes refer to police as Bobbies. That is why it's from his name, Robert. The next chap along, looking very austere and solemn, is William Ewart Gladstone. He was Prime Minister four times in the last century. He wasn't very good at dealing with the ladies, Gladstone. Well, some of us have that problem, don't we? But uh, Gladstone, when he went to see the Queen, if she invited him to sit down, he couldn't. He was so nervous. And I'll just break off because every hour on the hour, we stop and we say a prayer to remind us this is a house of God. It's not simply a museum. And that's going to happen now. All our visitors to join with us in one minute of stillness, silence, and prayer. Une minute de silence et de recueillement, s'il vous plaît. Bitte, eine minute stille und gebet. I ask you, therefore, to be still, sitting or standing as you prefer, while we remember God, to whose glory this great church was built. And let us remember also those less fortunate than ourselves. The English have always been cliquey. It's part of their charm, or their lack of it. And the burial and memorial customs of the Abbey contrive to make them as cliquey in death as they are in life. The most obvious clique being the writers and poets gathered here in Poets' Corner. But all over the Abbey are similar groupings, little knots of the like-minded. Architects in one corner, scientists in another, engineers, musicians. Even Sir John Franklin, the polar explorer, has found someone similar to keep him warm. It's the English liking for clubs. And of course it means that when the last trump sounds and the dead begin to clamber out of their graves, 
there won't be any awkward standing about like there is at the start of a party. Everybody will have somebody to talk to. Henry III can enjoy a joke with Charles II. Darwin can bring Newton up to date on the latest developments. It'll all be very relaxed. Of course, a lot of them will be talking shop, but that's the English idea of heaven anyway. Together with the coronation chair and the tomb of the unknown warrior, Poet's Corner is the most famous feature of the Abbey. And once upon a time, it would be the first glimpse you would get of the interior. But in the 19th century, visitors came in by this door. And it was the door which, in 1820, the wretched and rejected, drunken and unwashed Queen Caroline was refused admission to the coronation of her husband, George IV. The first poet to be buried here was honoured not because he was a poet, but because he was a civil servant. This was Chaucer, who had been in the household of John of Gaunt and Richard II. The original tomb of the author of the Canterbury Tales was behind the postcard counter. His bones were brought over here in 1556 and put in this splendid tomb, which was probably looted from one of the monasteries dissolved by Henry VIII. Over here, of course, we've got some more famous names. You've got the very famous Charles Dickens, buried here on the instructions of Queen Victoria. Rudyard Kipling, Children's Tales, Jungle Book, etc. Thomas Hardy, another great name. And of course, I always... The English prefer their poets dead and respectable. And so many of the writers buried or remembered here are safer in death than they ever were in life. The atheist Shelley would be shocked to find himself here, and Keats too, probably. It was Harold Nicholson who was instrumental in getting their monument put up, and he was nervous lest it might look like a sausage, which it does a bit. Orton, like Shelley, might find himself a bit uneasy about being here. He left England because it was too cosy, went to live in America. And now here he is, commemorated in the Abbey's coziest corner. And this is Wordsworth, who's actually buried in Grasmere. He's rather less lonely as a cloud in Poet's Corner, and in some rather odd company. Joshua Ward, who invented Fry's Balsam. The botanist Stephen Hales, who also dreamed up the ventilator. Oh, and he's lost his pen. There are a few furtive monuments in the Abbey. If human beings were modest, it would be a much emptier place. Vanity is the great commanding passion of all, wrote Sheridan. It is this that produces the most grand and heroic deeds or impels to the most dreadful crimes. Save me but from this passion, and I can defy the others. They are mere urchins, but this is a giant. It was Sheridan's vanity that made him think more of himself as a politician than a playwright. In his view, he belonged at the West End, together with his contemporaries, Pitt and Fox. Instead, he's landed up here in Poet's Corner, along with the riffraff like Dickens and Kipling and Shakespeare. Ready, troops? March. <laughs> and so we are known as a royal peculiar. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has no say whatsoever about Westminster Abbey. And in fact, he has to wait 
for an invitation or ask permission to take a service here. And the only time he can come into this abbey without permission to take a service is when we have a coronation. And that's the only time because he, as leader of the Church of England, has the right to uh, come and crown the head of the Church of England. So I don't want to this modern paving now. stone marks the spot where the playwright Ben Johnson is buried. And against the wall is the original gravestone with his name misspelled. I don't know much about Ben Johnson, except that he was more one of the boys than Shakespeare was, though not so good at the plays. Even his grave was a bit of a joke, as he asked to be buried upright because he couldn't afford a full-length grave. So I suppose that means that come the Day of Judgment, he'll just pop straight up like the Demon King in the pantomime. It isn't fanciful, because when they were digging this grave in 1849, the gravedigger saw two shin bones upright in the sand, and Johnson's skull came tumbling down into the grave. Which is more Hamlet than Ben Johnson. This is known as Our Lady Chapel. It's dedicated to Henry VII, who caused it to be built. The Queen has a stall in that left-hand corner, and again, she shares that with the Dean, but of course, only one at a time. Henry VII's chapel, of course, the architecture um, is uh, very different uh, to what you saw uh, while you were in the uh, nave of the church. If you look up, uh, you'll see the uh, architecture that drastically changes uh, to the uh, perpendicular uh, straight the way up to the, this magnificent uh, uh, fan vaulting of the scene. And that English Deve notar el techo. Este tipo de techo solamente se ve en Inglaterra. Recuerdan cuando en Cambridge inventaron el estilo inglés perpendicular. Now the flags here belong to the Knights of the Order of the Bar, an honour given to military people and civil servants who have done deeds for their country. Yes, but for all the stalls and banners and helmets, it's just a lot of middle-aged men who've done well behind a desk. But then, most things are nowadays. And no ladies, of course. The story uh, behind it is that the um, soldiers, before they went into battle, had a bath first, uh, before they were given this very high accolade or decoration. But now it's a, an act sort of, of pageantry, and there's an installation every four years uh, to install a new living knight. You only have to think about the knights of old in battle, cased in armour from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet galloping towards you with a nasty looking object in their hand. Heraldry was the one chance you had to extend your life if you were quick and accurate. If you get it wrong Each today... Each stall uh, in this uh, chapel, there is a uh, stall here for a living knight and above the actual stall hangs uh, the uh, banner um, which is for the individual living knight. The, uh, Plates at the back of the stall, uh, well, they are for um, each knight, um, their coats of arms of each individual knight. The Abbey, certainly in its tombs and monuments, is very much a church of the establishment, the rich, the powerful, the famous. But there's always been an alternative tradition here. In Poets' Corner there are Milton, Shelley and Blake. None of them creatures of the establishment. And here is Charles James Fox. Dissolute, a gambler, a republican, a fighter for the abolition of the slave trade, and a darling of the public who paid his debts twice over. But this, thank God, is an independent place. Conformity will not get you in, nor money, nor bullying. It is indeed a peculiar. So on this September morning, we come to what is the most famous tomb of all. There's not much democracy in the Abbey, which is above all a place of names. Most of them the names of the great and the powerful. 
but the most famous and the most emulated grave is of someone who has no name at all. The notion of the tomb of an unknown warrior was that of David Railton, an army chaplain in the First War, and it was taken up enthusiastically by the then Dean of Westminster, Dean Ryle, though there were some misgivings in high places. The body was brought from France with elaborate precautions to ensure its anonymity and buried here just inside the west door on November the 11th, 1920. No one else had ever been buried at this spot and digging down they came straight away to the sand and gravel of Thorny Island. Then the coffin was put in and filled with soil that had been brought from the various battlefields in France. A precise reversal of the Rupert Brooke poem there'll be some corner of a foreign field that will be forever England. The corner of the foreign field is here. The burial itself was not auspicious, crowded as the stone itself is crowded, with obvious dignitaries, and a clutch of those generals and field marshals whose boneheadedness had probably helped to put this soldier in the grave in the first place. But in time, such accretions fell away, and though this is a routine stopping point for heads of state, its associations have always been popular and pacific. The notion of the unknown warrior retaining its power simply because he could be anybody. Unlike the cenotaph, which is just up the road, which is and means an empty tomb, it has come to house our conflicting attitudes to war. The services at the cenotaph under the cold eyes of Earl Haig somehow seeming to celebrate what they also deplore. The morning here, though, is unambiguous. And bedded down behind his little hedge, this soldier outranks whoever else is buried here. This is the most honored grave in the Abbey. All other graves can be walked over, but not his. Concerns that govern human behavior in life do not grow less petty or more noble in death. And did one want a single guiding principle about burial in the Abbey throughout its history, it would be, whom would you like to be seen dead with? For centuries, the center of gravity in the Abbey was the shrine of Edward the Confessor, the saint who was also a king. And if you were a royal personage, you got yourself buried as near as possible to the shrine, huddling up to this illustrious corpse. So we have Henry III, Edward I, Henry V, umpteen royal personages, and here is Richard II. But one king isn't where he should be, and that's the founder of the Stuart dynasty, James I. This is the Lady Chapel, and he ought to be here. Beside the body of his wife, Anne of Denmark, who's tombstone is somewhere under the organ. She was six foot seven and he was somewhat shorter so they must have made rather an odd couple. When the Dean, Dean Stanley, broke into the vault he found the huge coffin of Anne of Denmark but no sign of James I. He then embarked on a search through the vaults under the floor of the chapel and in the process made some touching and quite macabre discoveries. The search took him first down into the Stuart family vault, which is below this side chapel. Here, not unexpectedly, were the coffins of Mary, Queen of Scots, Charles II, William and Mary, and Queen Anne, but no James I. What he didn't expect was at the foot of the steps leading down into the vault, which are here, was a great tumbled heap of much smaller coffins 
some of them no larger than a cigar box. These were the ten babies of Charles II and his brother James, and the eighteen babies, many of them stillborn, of Queen Anne. Some of them anonymous, even unchristened. Only one had survived into proper childhood, and this was William, Duke of Gloucester, who died, aged eleven in 1700, of a fever occasioned by excessive dancing on his birthday. It was the practice then to wrap bodies in lead before putting them in the coffin, and since many of the coffins had perished or fallen away, this pathetic heap of infants, which represented the wreck of the Stuart dynasty, must just have looked like a little pile of grey jelly babies. Not all royal infants went to the grave so unlamented. This is the tomb of Princess Sophie, the daughter of James I. A rather elderly baby, she died only three days old. This is her sister, Princess Mary, who died the following year, age two. She just learned to talk, and as she was dying, she said, I go, I go, at last I go. And still in children's corner, in this urn, are some bones found in the Tower of London in 1674, and buried here by Charles II, thinking or hoping perhaps that they were the bones of the princes in the tower, perhaps murdered by Richard III. The urn was designed by Christopher Wren. Having searched everywhere else for James I, Dean Stanley was left with only one possibility. The Lady Chapel was built to house the tomb of Henry VII and his Queen and to glorify the Tudor dynasty of which he was the founder. And Dean Stanley obviously thought that James I would not want or dare to disturb the body of Henry VII. And so the vault beneath this tomb was the last place he thought to look. But there, of course, was the body of James I snuggling up to Henry VII. And Henry VII and his queen had had to bodge up to make room for the intruder. Except that James I did not think he was an intruder. He was the founder of the Stuart dynasty, so in his view he belonged next to the founder of the Tudors. It's the best example in the Abbey of the absurd lengths to which whom would you like to be seen dead with can lead. And here is Dean Stanley, who, aside from finding James I, did so much to establish the Abbey as the pantheon of the kingdom. Opening its doors, and indeed its floors, to the nation's most illustrious corpses. His grave occupies a prime site adjacent to the kings and queens, but then, if you're Dean of Westminster, I suppose one of the perks of the job is a well-situated grave. It's the sepulchral equivalent of what we in the theatre would call house seats. This is the tomb of Edward I, so massive and plain that touching it for the first time I thought it was made of cast iron, but it's actually Purbeck marble, the same material as the pillars. But it's so heavy and solid it's more like a safe than a tomb, though once upon a time it used to be opened regularly. Edward I was a great warrior, he was known as the Hammer of the Scots, but he failed to subdue Scotland. And when he died in 1307, he made his son promise when he was on his deathbed that if an English army ever moved against Scotland, his body would be carried at the head of it. And so regularly over the next century, the tomb was opened, the king's body taken out, wrapped in freshly oiled linen in case there was a campaign. But then in 1399, the king's dynasty ended. The promise was forgotten, the custom fell into disuse. Until, in 1778, out of sheer curiosity, the tomb was opened again. And there was the king, six foot two, perfectly preserved, wrapped in oiled linen, each arm, each leg, each hand, each finger, each toe separately wrapped. And over him, 
his royal robe. And after this carefully documented last glimpse, pitch was poured into the tomb and it was sealed forever. She is not dead, but sleepeth, we say. But if you want somewhere to sleep, the Abbey's not really the best place. Take Catherine of Valois. She was the wife of Henry V, Shakespeare's little Kate. And when Henry V died, she married again Owen Tudor, whose family, two generations later, inherited the throne. When she died, she was buried at the east end of the church, which happened to be the place that Henry VII selected for his lady chapel. So her coffin was dug up and put on one side and left. So here you have the daughter of Charles VI of France, the wife of Henry V, the mother of Henry VI, the grandmother of Henry VII, just lying there in a loose coffin. And she was still there 200 years later when Pepys came round the abbey, tipped the verger, pulled aside the plank and took up the body, which was now like a bit of old leather, and gave her a kiss. And he went home and wrote in his diary, and I reflected that this was my birthday, 36 years old, and I did first kiss a queen. And it wasn't until 200 years after that that she was really properly buried when Dean Stanley was tidying up the abbey and he buried her in this altar in the chantry of her husband, Henry V. Except they're still not together. She's on the first floor and he's downstairs. There's an almost unbroken tradition of magnanimity about the Abbey. Macaulay called it a temple of silence and reconciliation. And here repeatedly are found antagonisms laid to rest and enemies reconciled in death. This is the tomb of Elizabeth I. In old age, looking not unlike a Jacob sheep. She was the daughter of Henry VIII. Long years ago, when she was a girl, had been held captive and threatened with execution by her half-sister, Queen Mary, the elder daughter of Henry VIII, Mary a Catholic, Elizabeth a Protestant. Mary has no effigy, and for many years she had no grave, a coffin just left, covered with the broken stones from the altars that the Protestants had demolished. She was very unpopular, and at her funeral in this chapel, the congregation are said to have torn down the hangings from the walls in a frenzy of joy. Now her coffin lies in the vault below, with Elizabeth firmly on top of it. The inscription on the tomb reads, Partners both in throne and grave, here rest we, two sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, in the hope of one resurrection. In the corresponding position to Elizabeth on the other side of the Lady Chapel is the tomb of Mary, Queen of Scots, whom Elizabeth had executed. Mary, Queen of Scots, was the mother of James I. And when he came to the throne, he had her body brought here and erected this splendid tomb, making sure she was as honored in the grave as was her executioner. Elizabeth always pretended that she hadn't intended to execute Mary. But the men who did her dirty work are here in the Abbey too. This is Sir Thomas Bromley, the judge who tried and sentenced the Scottish Queen. Someone else implicated was Sir John Puckering, but he was able to blame his secretary, 
who having no powerful friends was the one who went to prison. Shoddy behaviour by the establishment all round. So what's new? James I left the tombs of his mother's executioners undisturbed. Unlike Charles II, who rooted out Cromwell and anybody who had to do with his father's death. But such vindictiveness, the Abbey run on political lines, never occurred again. So Pitt is here with Fox. Their differences, like those of Gladstone and Israeli, as much temperament as a politics. And like the lion and the unicorn embodying different sides of the English character. But perhaps the most magnanimous gesture of all is that here in the Abbey is the tomb of Charles Darwin, the bogey of so many Victorian clergymen, yet buried here and at the Abbey's request. Richard II is everywhere in the Abbey, though visitors will often pass by his picture the earliest contemporary portrait of an English monarch which hangs just inside the west door. He came to the throne as a boy in 1377 and as a king he was disastrous, ending up deposed and murdered. But he was one of the Abbey's greatest benefactors. And here above the south transept is his badge of the White Hart. After he was murdered by Henry IV, Richard was briefly buried in King's Langley. But in a fit of remorse, Henry V had the body brought here and buried near the shrine. Over the years, the tomb fell into disrepair, and Westminster schoolboys used to poke about in it with sticks, one of them even bringing out a rib. When it was opened to be repaired in 1871, they found the orb and the scepter and fragments of these shoes, just as in the picture. Oh, and he invented the handkerchief. All the way through. If you bring some engineering books up from the yard. High up on the wall of the north transept, in the alley below the rose window, George Burroughs, the clerk of works, and his men are battling with damp. With honeycomb, we can run Mike's MICC cable from well, one side and I'll transit to the other. Right. Right. Private this staircase is, but say the word television and all doors are open to you. It's the best perk of the job. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Right, I'll see you later. Right, let's check this one back. Do you want to have a it, George? Oh, a bloody time. High above the abbey floor, and unsuspected by most visitors, is a passage as wide as a country road that winds all round the building. The purpose of the Triforium has never been clear. One obvious suggestion is that since the abbey was always a stage for coronations and other royal ceremonies, so the Triforium was a kind of upper circle for spectators. But this can't be true because unless you stand at the very edge of the arch, you get no view of the abbey floor. What seems most likely is that Henry III intended the ground floor of the abbey to be a church and the upper story, the Triforium, to house yet more chapels. But since he never finished the lower church, he didn't even start on the second story, and when he died, its purpose was forgotten. So it remains, as we see it today, empty and unused. Walking round the Triforium, one has the sense that here are the attics of the Abbey, just waiting to be rummaged through, that there are lost treasures here, bits of history to be turned up. And so there are. Down in the nave, there's a monument to a Major Andre, an English officer in the American War of Independence, who was sent on a secret mission behind enemy lines 
and was captured by the colonists and reluctantly executed. George III, who felt more strongly than the politicians did about the loss of the colonists as part of his patrimony, much in the same way as the Queen feels about the Commonwealth, had Major Andre's body brought back and a monument erected to him. And this is the box in which the body came. What do you want us to look at today? I want to go and have a look at the pinnacles briefly, but then to yeah. concentrate on the freeze... The aptly named Donald Buttress oh, yes, I mean, is surveyor of the fabric, and Tim Crawley, the head carver of the Cambridge builders Ratty and Kett, whose only comparable job was restoring King's College Chapel. So much of the abbey has been restored over the years that little of the original outer stonework remains. So while not a fake, it's now a facsimile, a reproduction of itself. Are you happy with the weight of the foliage? I think so, yes, because from down below it will appear a lot more undercut. There's a lot of shadow, and I think we've now got these uh, cusps and so on much better. Yeah. The cusping and the crockets. Working, working off that leaf made a big yeah. difference. Yes, oh, absolutely, yes. It's very satisfying. It's been worth all the trouble because we didn't quite get it right, did we? Well, that's exactly what we need. That yeah. through view through there. Oh, that it's decorative true. treatment of the main. Yes, and this again. As well, the I individual think. character of each carver comes out, doesn't it? The yeah. six or seven of them. They all do it in a slightly different way, which is absolutely in the medieval tradition. Uh, we don't want uniformity under any circumstances. In the nave, they're rehearsing for Sunday's Battle of Britain service. Went up with him. When he approached the ascent of Beth Horon, Judas went out to meet him with a small company. But when they saw the army coming to meet them, they said to Judas, How can we, few as we are, fight against so strong and great a multitude? If you want to, it can be a bit more of a storyteller. Oh, right. It's a little bit flat on the page at the moment. In the pulpit from which Cranmer preached at the coronation of Edward VI, a young man who might prefer to be gunning his tornado low over our peaceful countryside. Particularly since Paul Ferguson, the presenter, is wanting to turn him into Laurence Olivier. The role of the few. So the more you can make of that, the better. Could we go back to... Oh, no. And again, a strong army of ungodly men. That's the last sentence on page 7. And again, a strong army of ungodly men went up, to, up with him to help him, to take vengeance on the sons of Israel. I used to hate taking up the collection. Where did you look when you were walking back was always the problem. Thank you. See you on Sunday. <laughs> Fall out for a smoke, if there's a smoking area. James I was one of the earliest opponents of smoking and indeed wrote a tract against it. And when Dean Stanley broke into Henry VII's vault and found James I's coffin, there beside it was a broken clay pipe. It must have been smoked by the workman who'd moved in the coffin. Death lays its icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down, and in the dust be equal made with the humble scythe and spade. wanted to be buried in the abbey and indeed left money for his monument which is one of the last works of the sculptor Rubiliac. He took immense trouble with the likeness modelling the face from Handel's death mask but the ear which might be thought to be Handel's vital organ was actually modelled on a friend of the sculptor's a Miss Rich. The first Handel festival was held in the abbey in 1784 and thereafter, the abbey was regularly converted into a concert hall for the purpose. Until 1834, when the Duke of Newcastle complained that the low price of the tickets was attracting the wrong sort of concert goer, mill workers and the like. My group, this way, please. People, people, people. 
but that's nothing new, and it's better than it was. But there were mobs in the 18th century and regular riots, particularly at fashionable funerals, which in those days took place at night. So many people were expected at Dickens' funeral that he had to be buried virtually in secret. The grave dug in the evening hastily when the last visitor had left, the service first thing next morning before visitors started to arrive. Afterwards, the crowds came in their thousands, including Tennis, who was something of a star attraction himself. And when people began to stand on chairs and on the tombs to get a glimpse of him, he had to take refuge in the sanctuary. But one never quite knew with Tennis. Like so many famous people, he wasn't averse to the limelight, just liked to have it controlled. Oh, and there's Kipling. And Hardy, only not his heart, which is buried in Dorset. This is the effigy of Philippa of Pinau, the Queen of Edward III, who died in 1369. It's alabaster, and her hair is covered in an elaborate net with little pins to which gold beads or precious stones would once have been attached, or of course long since gone. She's very battered and unadorned, and of course that's what we think the Middle Ages were like, but they weren't. They weren't like that at all. Anyone who thinks the English aren't showy and vulgar should look at the tomb of Lord Hunsdon, the cousin and chamberlain of Elizabeth I. The tallest monument in the abbey, it's so vast it's a more than adequate habitation for the living, let alone a resting place for the dead. Still, it's very jolly, and there's something of the fairground organ about it. You half expect a figure to pop out and blow a trumpet. I'll tell you the weather. <laughs> okay, on your feet, let's go. Unless they're royal or noble, women have a much harder time getting into the abbey than men, except, of course, as wives. Though there are quite a few notable women buried and commemorated here, there are also some notable absentees. George Eliot, for instance, not commemorated till 1980 kept out by the supposed irregularities of her private life. Elizabeth Barrett, not here, not even as the wife of Robert Browning. And Florence Nightingale, perhaps fittingly with her military connections, is in St Paul's. And the Bronte sisters, daughters of a much humbler church than this, were only commemorated in 1947. But of course, once you start on this game of who's here and who's not, there's no end to it. And if women have some cause for complaint, painters have more. There are no painters here at all. Perhaps because of their bohemian lives. Perhaps as a legacy of the old monastic view that the ear was the organ of instruction, the eye of temptation. There's Blake in this rather startling bust by Epstein, but he's not here as a painter, but on literary grounds. Evensong is the main service of the Abbey Day at Westminster, and half the afternoon is spent preparing for it. Some boys solemn, some carefree, some with hair that won't lie down. Invisible to the eyes of grown-ups, there will be a small society here, with its heroes and villains, and all the fearful hierarchy of boyhood. Good afternoon, boys. Martin Neary is the organist and master of the choristers. Mary looks first at the Hulls Westminster service, which is the setting for this evening. I'm going to ask a junior boy to clap me the rhythm on the first line into the second line. I'll play the piano part to start with, and then who's going to offer to do it? Yeah, sure. Okay, no problem. Upstairs, the lay vicars wait their turn to practice. 
It's not all darts and desk ants, though, as most have other jobs, though they're all, oddly, members of Actors' Equity. Right, if you're having practice shots. Well done, you went almost too sharp, didn't you, on that last note? But that was uh, carefully done, those semitones. Now, shall we see if we can have an arpeggio to expand our sound? A big crescendo through. The pillars here are so ridged and grooved, it's as if history itself had creaked its glacial way down the nave, though the scars were actually made by scaffolding from centuries of coronation. Parts of the fabric, though, are so worn they can't be touched. The brasses, for instance, and at the brass rubbing centre in the cloisters, they have to make do with replicas. The Abbey's greatest and most mysterious treasure is so fragile and precious it must always be kept covered up. But today, it's briefly on view. This is the 13th century Cosmati pavement, laid down before the high altar when the Abbey was built, and on the central boss of which the Chair of State stands at the coronation. Set in Purbeck marble, it's made of porphyry, onyx, marble and glass, and once carried long inscriptions inlaid in bronze, though what they meant is still the subject of conjecture. At the heart of the Abbey, it is a profound mystery. poet of Hull, who's not buried in the Abbey, wrote, The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. But it's not entirely true, as Dean Stanley, in the 19th century, poignantly found. In the vault beneath this stone lies George II, the last Hanoverian king to be buried in the Abbey. The others are at Windsor. His wife, Caroline of Anspach, died over 20 years before, and although the king had been consistently unfaithful to her, she'd been his closest friend and companion. So that when he died, he left instructions they should lie side by side. Hunting through the vaults for the body of James I, Dean Stanley broke into George II's vault and there were the coffins of the king and the queen, side by side, and a board had been withdrawn from each of the coffins, so that their dust did indeed mingle. And the two boards were still leant against the wall of the vault, where they'd been left more than a century before. Some marriages, though, don't survive the grave. Thomas Sissel ordered a triple tomb for himself and his two wives, and this is wife number one. Wife number two married him when she was really only a girl, and he was already old and gouty and pretty disgusting. But she stayed married to him for 12 years before he died. And she obviously decided that dead or alive, she didn't want to sleep with him a moment longer than she needed to. So when she died, aged 83, she made sure she got a tomb to herself in Winchester Cathedral leaving her place beside him empty. Even 
song in the offing now. So the last visitors troop out. Back to their buses, their hotels in Bayswater, and a chance to put their feet up before they go off to Cats or the Phantom. Not quite as long running as Westminster Abbey, but still all part of the heritage. Shown round by one of the clergy before we started these programmes, I saw that he bowed to the altar, as I used to do when I was a boy and very devout. I don't do it now because it would lay claim to a piety I don't feel. But not doing it feels wrong too, as it seems to assert an indifferent atheism I don't feel either. I was always taught to kneel and say a prayer when I came into a church, I don't do that fearful, I suppose, of being observed, or less fearful of being observed by the Almighty. to know large chunks of the prayer book by heart. But that's of course not much use these days. To go into a church knowing the Book of Common Prayer is about as useful as going into a disco knowing how to dance the Belita. This great building is a monument to tolerance and magnanimity and I value that more than a text. Even a text as imbued with history as the comfortable words of the prayer book. Cranmer, who preached from that pulpit, was one of the architects of the prayer book and was burnt at the stake. But he didn't die for English prose.
Doors closed at last, and the statues breathe a sigh of relief. If I'd known it was going to be as busy as this, I'd never have been buried here in the first place. chance now to really rest in peace, with only the organ scholar Louise Marsh doing her practice. For all that we're in the middle of a cemetery, strolling through some of its 3,000 odd graves, there isn't much sense of the presence of death. And not even at night is it in the least bit eerie. It's partly that death is not graphically presented. There are none of those cadaver tombs with the deceased on the upper story in his or her prime and on the lower the decaying corpse. It's as if, having secured a niche in this illustrious place, the dead have dressed up for the occasion, been laid out in their best, surrounded by their children and dependents. Or as time goes on, they're seen at some great climactic point in their lives, like General Wolfe, struck down on the heights of Abraham at his moment of triumph. There's really only one monument where death comes into its own, and it's the last work of the sculptor Rubiliac. Lady Elizabeth Nightingale died in premature childbirth, brought on by a thunderstorm, and death is represented as bursting through the iron doors of life to hurl his dart at her. And so hastily, as he seized it up, that he holds it by the feathers. It's a curious monument because the nightingales have fallen into rather stagey postures, and it's death who's full of life and vitality. The story's told that a thief broke into the abbey one night and caught sight of death in the moonlight and fled, leaving his crowbar behind him. And they still kept the crowbar till the end of the 19th century. But to be fair, it's the kind of story that's often told to authenticate the power of the illusion of art. some friends round. One of his 19th century predecessors, Dean Buckland, never showed anybody over the abbey without taking with him a feather duster, flicking the tombs as he told their history. And his body was brought here several years later, and they lie together in that tomb. If we just move over across to um, Edward III's tomb, and as you go, look back, because here you'll see the shrine has been built uh, so that there are these kneeling spaces along the side where the sick people used to go and pray for healing because one has to remember in the Middle Ages this was a great um, 
center of pilgrimage, uh, like St. Thomas's Shrine at Canterbury, the Shrine of Edward here at Westminster, uh, was enormously popular, and pilgrims would have come and prayed for healing uh, at the shrine. Now just turning to Edward III, this is a lovely effigy uh, of this sad old man who had a stroke just before he died, and you can see from the top, the corner of his mouth is turned down. And it's strangely, a lot of damage has been done to the Abbey, both at the Reformation and during the Commonwealth, and things have been stolen. And all the little figures on the tombs, many of them have been stolen or damaged, but not on this one. The, the angels are still here, if you can see, in these little niches, whereas they're not uh, in the other ones. And the other side, there are some lovely figures of his children, little bronze statues of his, of his children. And then, from here, you get a good view of the chantry, which was erected at the end of the With huge wax tapers burning round the tombs, and full of the murmur of masses for the dead, the medieval abbey at night must have been extraordinary. Here, the south transept, what's now Poet's Corner, would be thronged with monks hurrying through to their devotions in the choir. Before the dissolution, some of them, like present-day musicians, were putting in depths to say the service for them. But for all that, it must have remained a vast powerhouse of light and prayer and praise, like a great ship of faith voyaging through the night. Joseph Addison, who was buried in the Lady Chapel, called Westminster this great magazine of mortality and wrote that the solemnity of the building and the condition of the people who lie in it fill the mind with a kind of melancholy or rather thoughtfulness that is not disagreeable. When I see kings, wrote Addison, lying by those who deposed them, rival wits, placed side by side, or the holy men that divided the world with their contests and disputes. I reflect with sorrow and astonishment on the little competitions, factions and debates of mankind. And when I read the several dates of the tombs, of some that died yesterday and some 600 years ago, I consider that great day when we shall all of us be contemporaries and make our appearance together. So now, this is the Jerusalem chamber, which is quite a room. It was, in fact, built uh, as part of the abbot's lodging, because when it was a monastery, the whole of the courtyard out here and the rooms around it and our present deanery were part of the abbot's house. And it was built in the 1380s. So it's a 14th century room with a 14th century ceiling. All sorts of extraordinary events have happened in here. The authorized version of the Bible, the King James Version, was translated in here, and every major translation since has been worked on in this room. The fireplace, which is interesting, was put up by Dean John Williams, who was Dean to Charles I, in order to celebrate the betrothal of King Charles and Henrietta Maria of France, which was agreed at a great banquet in this room. And there are little um, faces, caricature faces almost, of uh, Henrietta Maria and King Charles across the front. Uh, but the most uh, famous thing, I suppose, that happened in this room was that in uh, 1413, King Henry IV suffered from leprosy and was in great pain and bent almost double, was determined to go to the Holy Land on pilgrimage. And he came to the Abbey and he prayed in that shrine that we've just been in of St. Edward. And when he was in the shrine, he was taken ill and he collapsed. And they thought he was dying. And they carried him down through the cloisters because the nave wasn't then complete. And they brought him in to the abbot's withdrawing room, which was this room called Jerusalem. It had been predicted that he would die in Jerusalem. And he recovered consciousness 
the story is and asked where he was. And he was told he was in Jerusalem, because this has always been called Jerusalem Room. And Shakespeare actually sets um, uh, a scene in Henry IV, Part Two in this room of the king's death. And by chance, I got a copy of, of, of Shakespeare's Henry IV. And I want to just read you those last lines from that particular scene. King Henry says, Doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? And Warwick says, Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord, the king. Lord be to God, even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years, I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I suppose the Holy Land. But bear me to that chamber, there I'll lie, in that Jerusalem shall Harry die. Now, at nine o'clock, come the Queen's scholars to say the last service of the day, Compline, in St. Faith's Chapel. I'm treading the same route across the south transept as once the monks did. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Amen. Brethren, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Let us pray. With it we beseech thee, O Lord, this place, and drive far from it all the snares of the enemy. Let thy holy angels dwell herein to preserve us in peace, and may thy blessing be upon us evermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I will lay me down in peace and take my rest. For it is thou, Lord, only that makest me dwell in safety. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. God the Father bless us. God the Son defend us. God the Holy Ghost preserve us and grant unto us with all his faithful servants, living and departed, rest and peace. Amen. In the 19th century, Dean Stanley wrote that Westminster Abbey was a mirror of England. He meant in its splendour and ceremony. And in these egalitarian days, that sounds a touch grandiose and rhetorical. But if we reflect that this unique place and its contents what remains when greed, theft, violence and occasional vindictiveness have done their work? <laughs>